myself and still do things my way. I love you. I'm sorry. I still do things I thank you. I love you. Hi, my name is Dr. Philip Alexander and welcome to the World Revolution Podcast. And I'm here with Rick Ely, uh, who is also known as the Breath of Eli. Welcome. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Dr. Phil. My <laughs> pleasure, my honor to be here. Uh, so, Rick, you are a former property developer. Uh, you accumulated a wealth of $20 million and, uh, and you went through, uh, through some challenges. Uh, you went down to minus $10 million and then uh, found yourself breaking even. And from there, uh, triggered... I suppose a spiritual awakening of some sort and um, I would say that now you're dedicated yourself as a conscious servant to the planet would that be correct yeah I haven't heard it that way outside of my own mouth but yeah I'd say that's pretty pretty on par so well let's uh let's start with uh, a breath because um I'm curious to know what the breath of Eli actually means yeah, let's let's do that. Let's just drop right now. We'll drop right into our breath and just follow me in and and we'll get this. So just to take a deep breath right through the nose. And then exhale. Making that ha sound. So in through the nose. And then one more. All right. And during that time, my focus was really on my heart center, just grounded and centered, but just the, the, the conscious act of breathing, even though our bodies breathe themselves, it breathes for us. It's amazing what the subconscious does for us just all on its own. Right. I mean, but the taking the act, taking the time out, the moment to just ground and center, feel the breath, feel the heart space, and allow, allow my heart to take precedence over my mind. So I'm basically what I'm doing when I'm going into that breath state is giving my heart permission, giving my mind to relinquish to my heart and just breathe and so now i can just be here fully present in your presence so thank you love that thank you brother um yeah there, there are a lot of uh, teachings and even in just just in general in meditation practice uh where you're just focusing on your breath so there must be something um so powerful about that Absolutely. There's so many esoteric, so much esoteric wisdom. And when you think of esoteric, it, all it really means is, you know, secret, like withheld. So they don't teach this stuff in school. Um, at least they haven't, not in my day, but now they're beginning to. I mean, my youngest is nine and, you know, she was teaching me some yoga moves. And, uh, and in fact, one day she came home from school and she says, Daddy, my math teacher breathes like you. He you know, he, t he tells us to take a breath and it's like, awesome. Wow. You know, so that's, uh, yeah. Mm. Well, lots, lots of, lots of good stuff out there. Yeah. Um, I, um, so I, I recently was listening to a teaching, uh, which was to do with the breath and, um, it, it came with this question of who am I? And what answer you actually get when you ask that question, who am I? And the answer is, is actually your breath. Because <laughs> when you ask that, that question, you're breathing. That's the next answer. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that kind of answers your question, who's the breath of Eli? It, it is it, it's that which is breathing me. And um, so... You know, we come into this world and we get all these labels and, you know, we're, we're told who we are. And people have so often have an identity of saying, 
you know, they're in a community or in a family and you are supposed to be this in this societal way to this group, to this family, to this unit, to this. But I promise you that we are so much more than that. And that is, I would say that's what I figured out. That's what I remembered um, is that I'm much more than that. And, and if perhaps I've always known, I mean, perhaps I actually came in knowing. Um, and oftentimes we forget along the way, you know, the experiences of life, the teachings that we, you know, we embody. We don't know what we don't know until you know, you know. I mean, that's, it's, but then again, you always knew. You just forgot for a moment who you really were. You were embodying the, the persona. You, you were wearing the mask to fit in, to be accepted, to be part of a community. To, and we're all doing the best that we can in every moment and every, at every time. So I've just come to come to a place in my life where I recognize the divinity within everyone and I see that everyone is perfect as they are. And the moments that I find myself triggered or angst or an anxiety or, you know, some sort of emotional response, I look within myself and I, I take a higher approach, you know, I get outside of myself as the observer. Oh, that's interesting. What does that mean? <laughs> Rather than, you know, fight, flight, you know, anger, frustration. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm human, Phil, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I do this like to the T all the time. And, you know, I'm this perfect saint because I'm certainly, you know, I'm, I'm a human being. We're all human. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Yeah. And, um, but what I've learned along the way is to the, the purpose that the emotions are serving me as opposed to me being a servant to the emotion and to the environment. So that is where uh, I think that's where I'm at today in this moment in time. Okay. Uh, can we go into your life journey where it all began? Um, what, what you went through, how, how you discovered uh, things about yourself and that point where you uh, started to, to, to look within. Mm. Yeah, how far back do you want to go? You know, where do you want to... Again, it's like there's, there's all these paradigm shifts along the way. And so I am a, you know... I'll be 47 this year. I'm 40, 46 years old. I've been rich. I've been poor. I've been sick. I've been healthy. I've been somewhere in between. I've experienced spontaneous healing. And today I have a peace that passes all understanding. And when you say the peace that passes all understanding, right, that, that's the place you go. What does that mean? What does a peace that passes all understanding mean? And what it means to me, Phil, is neutrality. It's the place where there is no anxiety. There is, you're, you're neither positive nor negative. You're neither, it's neither hot nor cold, good nor bad. It's the place where all information exists, where it's actually illuminated, where you are not projecting, where I'm not projecting my experience or my emotion or any giving anything, any meaning it's complete neutrality, complete peace, silence. All the information is illuminated. And from there, from that place, one can act, can go anywhere, anywhere they want to. Right. From the heart center, from that place of neutrality, from that place of peace, the peace that passes all understanding the entire universe is your creation and you go anywhere you want to go. So um, how did I get to that place? You know, how, what was this journey along the way? I mean, how far back do you want to go, Phil? Uh, 
I think everything that we do starts from our childhood and okay. our family. So I'd love to go right from the beginning. Sure. You know, it's funny because I'm writing my first book called a, called an awakening and it's a, a journey to sobriety. And as I, and as I began this book, um, I, <laughs> I can remember the first drink that I had as a toddler. It was like, I was a year and a half old, like less than a year and a half old. I was sitting at my parents' ranch and you have one of them brown bottles, you know, one of the, just no name, nothing on the bottle, just a brown bottle. And you know, it had some kind of suds in it. And there was something that was meant for, you know, big people, not little people. And that's probably the first drink I had. And um, in all my life, I came in kicking and screaming. I was born to uh, a mom, a mother and father. My parents have been married about 50 years now. My dad's 70, 75. Uh, my mom's like 73, 72. Amazing, beautiful, beautiful heart, big, giant heart. But before I was ever born, my mom had an ovarian cyst, and a, uh, she went into a coma for a couple of weeks. They had lack of oxygen to her brain while they were do, performing the surgery. And they, um, when she came out, she had no more memory. She... Um, the doctors, the priests, everybody had told my father should leave, you know, she'll never be the same. And my dad, in fact, my dad, they told my dad, just, just go, she'll never be the same. And they weren't married yet. Uh, but my dad stood, stood by her side and he taught her how to walk, talk, eat, uh, put a brush her teeth, you know, put charts up together and and he supported and he took care of my mom and they were never supposed to have kids. And when, uh, when the moment came that they were pregnant, everybody said, get an abortion. You know, you're incapable of having a child. You, you can't raise a child. You are a child. And um, they said, no, this is a miracle. This is a miracle, baby. We're going to have, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have this child. And so I was born. And um, I, I, my, my parents, both of them had, you know, my, my dad had seven brothers and sisters and my mom had five, you know, there's five and seven and it's a big families on both sides. Um, pretty close, you know, pretty close families. I, I never went to the same grade school in the same year. And I mean, I was kicked out of every single school from kindergarten on up. The first school I went to in kindergarten, um, I think they called my parents and sent me home because I had, I had told, it was like sharing time, right? I mean, circle time. And, you know, for whatever reason, I had just come out of this dream and it was like my father had died in this dream and I was deeply, deeply saddened and I was, I was sharing that my father had died. And so they called the, <laughs> called my home. What's going on? Your dad, his, his, just, his dad died? Is everything okay at home? And, and so they sent me back to, you know, one school after another, you know, I had, uh, I'm gonna close my door real quick. My wife and my daughter just got home, so it'll be. Hey guys, come on, Sasha, you coming? Here you go, good girl. Let my, let my pop come in, otherwise she'll be banging on the door. <laughs> and um, so they they sent me to special schools. I went to, you know, they're on Ritalin. All, I was like this hyperactive kid. I had more energy than they had any idea what to do with. And they um, so I was, you know, that was my programming to eight years old. It was going to every single, you know, going to a different school, special schools. Um, I did not have a traditional 
you know, a, a traditional education. And by the time I was probably in sixth grade, the first time I was in sixth grade, I uh, some, something was going on with my parents, and I was on a bunch of medication, and I took a, a handful of pills, and I um, in front of the teacher, you know, I'm just like. Pfft. I'm just crying out for help. I'm, I'm, and I can remember at that time, my, you know, my grandma, you know, being in the hospital, getting my stomach pumped and my grandma telling my, my parents, he's crazy. He needs to go into a mental hospital. You know, he's, he's just crazy. And so here's all my family. Something's, you're broken. Something's wrong with you. What's wrong with you? We've got to give you all this medication, send you all these schools. Why can't you just conform? Why don't you just do what we tell you to do? And be, just be a good boy and do what you need to do. And that was my life. You know, by the time I was in seventh grade, I think I had my stomach pumped. I drank every bit of liquor that was in my um, parents' liquor cabinet. And uh, by the time I was... Yeah, 11, I, I think I went to a boarding school, got shipped off to a boarding school in Provo, Utah. And that was shortly after spending a year in a foster home where I experienced, a, you know, molestation for a year. And so many, many, you know, experiences along the way, whether it was, uh, you know, being molested as a little kid to having an experience when I'm, you know, 11 you know, for a year and then all through school is my way of checking out was, was alcohol. And, uh, and it didn't, I didn't get to that. I just, I just didn't know how to, uh, to be me because what being me was unacceptable in everyone else's eyes. I, I couldn't conform. I couldn't be me. And so I was always looking to be happy and just, you know, did a lot of wild and crazy stuff. And um, somewhere along the way, you know, I had uh, I decided I was going to be an airline pilot. I was going to, you know, fly planes. And I was enrolled in a, in a college to go to uh, flight, you know, flight school. And um, I got a call from my mom. I was actually like, I was actually living in Seattle, made my way to Alaska. Cause I, I spent 10 years out at sea, Phil. I was a, a merchant Marine. I spent yeah. 10 years out at sea as, as a chief engineer and I cut my teeth on fishing boats and stuff. And this is where it kind of, kind of a segue for me. What had happened is I had this plan to pay for my college by going to Alaska to crab fish in Alaska. It was like the most dangerous profession in the world. I, I took a, you know, I, I'd actually taken a one way ticket to Kodiak, Alaska in the middle of winter. Who does that kind of stuff? Right. I mean, <laughs> but, but before that I'd even taken a train, you know, I was like 16, 17 years old and I tried to make my way to Alaska. Then um, and I, and I got as far as, you know, the, the Northwest. So I, I got 1500 miles away, but I didn't make it the whole, the whole journey. And what had happened is I found myself in Seattle preparing to go to college. And I got a phone call from my dad or from my mom. And she said, my dad was in the hospital and he'd been shot. So he'd been shot three times, once through, once through his left hand and twice through his, in his stomach. And she says, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if he's going to live. He's in critical condition. Sure. And at that moment I had really, I mean, didn't really have, I mean, I was planning to go to college. I was living with a roommate in Seattle. And I had two possessions. I had like this 1972 Javelin and a 38 special, you know, I mean, who, a revolver of all things, right? A girlfriend had given me a revolver. And so I hocked them for plane fare to my roommate and I flew down to Phoenix. 
And I stayed a year with my parents to get my dad back on his feet. And, um, and then I headed off to, to San Diego to where I grew up. It, it kind of like, what's next? Where am I going? What am I doing? And I jumped on a boat. I jumped on a fishing boat in, in San Diego and I headed to Mexico. And I spent from that point, you know, I, I can remember looking at the guy, the captain and telling him, Hey, give me half a chance. I'll be your best man. And I was the only white boy. And I spent uh, the next six months learning how to be a fisherman and an engineer. And I, I carried the chief's tools and I learned every aspect of the boat. I was already very mechanically inclined. I mean, I, I, I'm super smart. It wasn't that I wasn't, you know, intelligent. It was that I, I just didn't want to conform to what everybody else was, you know, doing. And so was I born awake and rebellious? And yeah, okay, I'll, I'll buy that. So I spent 10 years out of sea and um, when I met my wife and I was traveling in the Northwest and I met my wife and I, uh, I fell in love. I, I met a woman that had incredible values and morals. Like I'd never met anyone like that in my life. And so here I am pouring out my, you know, pouring out my life story and, you know, and, uh, and she accepted me as it was. She showed me this love and acceptance that I never even, I couldn't even comprehend. I mean, honestly, I, I can't tell you the women, the amount of women that I'd slept with. You know, I, I just, you know, she asked me, gosh, is it possible you have AIDS? You know, I mean, you have to get an AIDS test. You know, you slept with so many people. And here's this 26-year-old, 25-year-old virgin. You know, she'd been through college and she got all the way through college without you know, I mean, she had these morals and values and way beyond the values and morals that I had. I mean, I, I didn't know what bear, I didn't know what boundaries were. I knew no boundaries. I did what I wanted to do and I went where I wanted to go and I was free. And yet this woman, you know, she, uh, she accepted me as I was and that was that, you know, three, three years, you know, Three years into our marriage, we decided we were going to raise kids, had uh, adopted three children. But prior to getting off the boat, you know, prior to adopting children, I said everybody that I knew that worked offshore had, uh, they, they were all divorced. And everything in my family and her family, you know, there was this, nobody divorced, you know, there was. It was just, it was taboo. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't accepted. There was this longevity in marriage, this partnership, this idea of partnership. And, um, and so I valued that. I wanted to live my dreams and I, I, I got into real estate, something I always wanted to do. I always wanted to be a real estate investor and never really wanted to be a, a broker, but that was the fastest way that I could, um, could learn, you know, and so I started studying while I was on the boats and um, got my broker's license and, you know, and then away I went. I got into real estate the first year in real estate. I, um, I think I closed like $7 million worth of business and I, you know, I'd made 150 grand. And when I worked offshore, I was making a couple hundred grand a year working six months out of the year. So I was already doing pretty well. Um, but I mean, for the first out of the gate, that was, that was great, you know, and that was, uh, and I found mentors and along the way, my, my journey has always been, I've always sought out mentors. I've always sought out people that are smarter than me in something that I'm passionate about to learn and to grow from. I always figured if I can find a way to add value in a relationship, that I would do that. I would, that would be my contribution and that would allow me access to the people that I wanted to learn and grow from. And, and I did that. I found some incredible mentors. I, I made, um, found a broker that I meant that mentored me. By year three, I was, you know, I'd already had a net worth of close to 5 million and I was already an investor 
um, in multiple projects by year, you know, year five, I was trying to go from a millionaire to a billionaire. And, uh, had projects all over the country, you know, predominantly in the Northwest. <clears throat> I could have retired at, you know, at 30, 33, 34. And I didn't even get my real estate license until I was 30. And um, all of that, all that journey, it was like, it's kind of like a whirlwind. You know, I look back and now and my kids are um, 21. Seventeen and nine, and all three of them are adopted. They've all come from, you know, from different places. And incredible, you know, incredible kids. I, you know, and at the time, I thought I was saving them. You know, I thought that was my duty. Oh, I'm going to save these kids from this. You know, this, they're coming out of the system. They're having these, you know, parents that have been in the system. That are, maybe they're alcoholic. Maybe they're at. And I guess for the, the first part of their lives, I was, um, for the first part of their lives, I, I was very, very stable. You know, I'd, I was teaching Sunday school. <laughs> I mean, with my wife, this was the ideal, right? I mean, I'm coaching baseball. I'm, I'm this incredible leader in the community and I'm, I'm mentoring people and I'm doing and all of the while I I think something clicked the moment that I was teaching Sunday school there's these college kids and I just couldn't swallow the doctrine of eternal damnation it just it wasn't I it didn't jive it wasn't buying it and you know, I'd known, like, I've had bouts of thinking that maybe I should be a preacher at some point. And, you know, you get these ideas of, you know, who am I? And you wear these different masks along the way with the beliefs that we hold. And, and so I had this conversation with a preacher, and, and he said, well, Rick, some things you just got to take on faith. Hmm. That's how you see God. And I knew that at the moment that if that's how, how you see God, how you are going to treat your fellow man. Right. So if you see God as this tyrannical God that is, you know, out there just clubbing you once you, you know, you're going to step out of line and you're going to put you in your place. That's how you're going to treat your fellow man. And, um, and I, while I might not have had it all figured out at that moment in time, I, maybe I don't now, but I, I certainly have peace. Um, and I don't feel like I have to change anyone. Like, nobody's broken. You're all perfect as you are. So, I mean, that's a pretty beautiful model of the world, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And, and to come from the place that, you know, where I recognize that I created all of this, that how I made you, it. How do you mean? Oh, how do I mean? So, <laughs> hmm. May I may I answer that after I finish the yes of course that yeah. place okay wonderful I will thank you um so I got halfway you know halfway into these kids lives and I've I've got two projects like I've got my brokerage and I've got this big you know four hundred acre project that I'm doing a two hundred eighty five lot subdivision and a big mixed use project on the river and four hundred acres and. I'm excited about building homes up there with my, and I can see my son. I'm envisioning my son and my wife's going in a different direction and I'm going in a different direction and, and, and I'm drinking like a fish because the market's tanked and, and I'm not giving up. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not giving up. And I, and I, and I, so I chose the project because that's what I had the most invested in. And that was what I was most passionate about. Honestly, it's what I was most passionate about. It was the biggest dream that I had. And I felt that, you know, and so I'm going after it. But I was so sick by the time I'm, you know, I, I was so sick by the time I, I damn near drank myself to death. I mean, I literally, I was, I got to the point where I had, I was drinking 
almost a gallon of, you know, whiskey and vodka and, you know, uh, smoking weed and uh, just anything I could do to escape. And I, and I couldn't function otherwise. I, I literally, I couldn't function otherwise. And I, that, along with, you know, uh, wine and beer and everything else. And I was highly functioning. Nobody could tell. Nobody could see what was really going on, you know. I mean, somebody, dude, somebody had to know something, right? I mean, somebody, some, my wife, there's this distance and there's not connection. It's like, but everything's functioning, you know, everything's going along. And nobody's, nobody's dying. <laughs> Except me, I was dying. I was dying inside. And I got a call from a friend of mine. Uh, I hadn't seen, we owned some cabins together. We, um, we had some recreational property that we'd, developed and any he, he calls me up out of the blue i hadn't seen him in about a year and a half and he says to me he says rick where are you what's going on i said oh, i'm out in front of the house he's he says uh i said i just dropped the kids off at school what what's going on mikey and this is a guy that will never tell you anything bad right he this is the guy he's, i call him smiley mikey because he just he's just beaming he loves mikey is just he's got this giant heart he loves everybody does nothing but make him smile can't say a bad thing and and he says can i talk to you i got something i gotta say i gotta say wow, okay, I sit down with Mikey. Okay, yeah, Mikey, lay it on me. What's going on? And I'd already had half a glass of wine or half a bottle of wine by that time. It's only 8 o'clock in the morning. And he says, Rick, he says, the Holy Spirit told me that you need to be sober. And he said, for the next three years. And I was like, <laughs> boom, brought me to my knees. Bam, because I knew in that moment in time, I knew exactly where I was. And I couldn't get out. I was just, I was done. I was, I was done. I was dying. And, um, so I dropped to my knees and I cried and, you know, from 150 miles away, he held me and he's, and, uh, and I told him, frankly, I said, Mike, I said, you know, I hear you. There's nothing I can do at this moment in time. I, I mean, I would love to say, you know, that's it. Here I go. It's a, it's a fresh, you know, it's a fresh start. Um, but, you know, I just bought a gallon of whiskey and vodka and a bag of weed, and I was ready for the weekend. Sunday came along after church, and I... I had a conversation with my son. I asked him, my son's 17 at the time. He was getting ready to graduate from high school. And I said, I said, will you take a walk with me? And he said, uh, he said yeah. Dad. So off we went. We took a walk up the hill, found ourselves in the middle of a field. And I, and I said to him, I said, you know, son, I'm, I'm, I love you with all of my heart and all of my soul. And I have left holes in your life. I've left holes and big gaping holes that I'll never be able to fill. And that you're the only one that's ever going to be able to fill these. But I promise you one thing. I promise you that it's not out of a lack of love because I love you with all that I am. All that I am. He says, Dad, I know, I know. And I said, but I'm really, really sick. I'm really sick, and I need help, and I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to do this. And he said to me, he said, Dad, he said, I'm just glad you're willing to change. I'm just glad you're willing to change. And that was enough. That was enough for me. That was enough because it was, I found myself on my, on my bed with all my children and my wife. And I said, Hey, I'm sick. I need help. I, you know, check me into a hospital or whatever, but I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't go on like this. 
and uh, they all loved up on me and you know and th and that's that was three years ago that was that was three years ago yeah. so um i'm sober today you know i haven't had a drink in three years and you know a couple months and but i've been truly sober for about a year you know a year and a few months because i weaned myself off of alcohol with pot and uh and so i i we moved to maui and i'm living in i was living in maui and i just knew at that point that it was time to come out time to come out of the out of the shadows there was another you know download that i had received you know straight from source from god that said okay it's, it's it's okay now you can come out of the shadow and i knew what that meant that meant that i had to be completely sober there's nothing wrong with alcohol there's nothing wrong with um you know recreational drugs there's none of, I, I don't place any judgment on any of those things for anyone They're, it's perfectly fine for me it was a means of exiting reality of checking out of not of not being present and what i found the gift in life is being present to be present in the presence that is the gift and uh, so yeah i uh I, I didn't know where this was going I, I didn't know this is completely unscripted we you know you asked me to start and so i've just kind of I've allowed it to just flow with no, with no agenda and uh, being very, very confident in who it is I am and thankful and grateful and, uh, and just with a sense of, of love and compassion for those that suffer because we don't have to suffer. Suffering is, pain is inevitable, but, but suffering is optional. And so when we figure out those tools of how, you know, how we can graduate from our suffering and enjoy our best life ever, uh, it's pretty miraculous and wonderful. So I'm going to take a break from talking and let you and just get some of your feedback, if I may. Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Rick. That was really, um, it's really touching. Um, I, I found that uh, what happened to you three years ago was it was a repetition of your childhood. There's some reason we keep replaying themes in our life, um, but we evolve as we replay those themes. So it's like um, the, th the, the ways that we... Uh, um, the things that we believed about ourselves as children and uh, the things that we've ingrained in our, in our thoughts and our mind, um, it eventually it plays out uh, as you journey through life. Um, and it seems like you needed uh, that occurrence three years ago for you to awaken to who you are now. And perhaps in the future it may also repeat, but just in a different way where you expand even more. Mm. Yeah, it's constant expansion. You know, I, I think there are themes in our lives along the way that we do. We recycle, we repeat. Now, we can, we can cycle up or we can, you know, or flush out. <laughs> or flush out. And uh, you are your path. So there's no... There's no right or wrong path. It just is your path. It's not, there, there is no judgment in it. It's, um, we give everything meaning. We, we are so much more than we've ever been programmed or led to believe. Uh, we don't have to be sick. You know, we, we are our own healers. And so, in my in this process for me as i began you know coming alive is I, I i i got this download one day 
I'm sitting in the middle of my yard. It's a sunny day. And I'm sitting on my boat in the yard, <laughs> looking up at the sun. And I, it was clear as a bell. It was like this just download of trans of information. And it was all inside of me. All of the dark and all of the light. Hitler and Jesus, all of it lived inside of me. I had the potentiality of everything, of all the light and all the dark. And it was okay. It was like, whew. And I rested in it. And I, um, I mean, I, I cried and I absorbed it. But there was no longer any judgment. There was no, there was no need because I already was all of that. I mean, who's going to judge me? Me? I mean, am I going to continue? Hey, baby. Honey, I'm on a, a call. Thank you. You're going to take some shower? Thank you, baby. Well, um, hmm. Your, everything that you've been through, like it, the 7 billion people on the planet, everyone's got their own life story and life journey. Why were you able to have these experiences and perhaps others don't in the way that you have experienced it? Because everyone's experiencing something of the same nature, but what you are talking about is something that comes from, um, I would say a, an expanded, uh, nature of understanding or let's say a higher level of understanding in consciousness. I, um, I, I can, I think I can get right to the point of what you're asking. And at, at the point, so there was a point in time for me where, you know, even as I'm in the middle of, you know, trying to work through the process, trying to go through all of the debt, trying to get, you know, I literally, I got back to a break even point, um, climbed out from, you know, from a net worth of a positive 20 to a negative 10 to, to break even. And, and it was a workout. I mean, it was a lot of work to get that, just to that break even point. And in the middle of all of that, You know, I, I knew that, that my character, like there was, there was just being honed. It was chipping away at what wasn't me or what I thought wasn't me. These attributes, these aspects. And I finally got to the place where there was nothing left. Where what was left of me, you could, was in the palm of my hand. And if you sneezed, it was all gone. There wasn't anything I could identify with as a husband, as a father, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a, you know, a successful business person. I couldn't identify with any of it. There was nothing left. And at that moment of being nobody, nothing, no one, in no place, in no time, everything changed. Everything changed. Uh, our I am statement, we struggle so hard to hang on to what we call I am. We say, I am this, I am that, I am, this is the persona, this is the mask, this is the, the identification of who, you know, who one is. And, but, I believe that we're all of it. We're, we're everything. And that is where it's like, now I can, I, you know, there's nothing that's separate from me, right? The, I can identify with the, the, uh, the thief. Okay. I can identify with the prostitute. I can identify with the murderer. There, there's nothing that's separate from me. There's no judgment left for me to place on humanity except accept it. 
And when I'm in acceptance of all that is, I have to accept myself. And so, so often, and many people who are addicted and why many people are, you know, face addiction, whether it's sex, alcohol, drugs, what work, right? Cause I can identify with many of those. The, um, it's a, it's a means to escape the, the reality of what is to face who you, you know, who you really are. And, and when you know, that you're all that is, you don't have to escape anymore. You, you don't have to escape anymore. And oftentimes we live in this, in shame or in guilt or in the, the inferior emotions that we were programmed with. And until we let that go, until we let go of all of those things, that would identify us or define us. Um, I guess that's been the secret, you know, I, it, it's just grace and love, mm. you know, I, I feel like I've just been showered in love and acceptance and compassion. Uh, I often say, be that which it is you want to experience. Mm. And so part of the process for me in, in, the, in, the, in the journey of the alcoholism, in the journey of the, you know, from the moment forward, moving forward, when I decided to stop, you know, drinking, um, every day I would, you know, I'd practice gratitude and appreciation. I, I started retooling, reframing because... Um, that's how I had been the majority of my life growing up. Even after, you know, I'd always been very positive, always looked at the bright side of everything, drive, drive, drive. And that's what, that, that's how I was geared. And then we get on a loop. Like right? we, we keep playing the same tape over and over and over again. You play the same tape over, you, you begin to believe it until you change your way of thinking. Because, your thoughts create things. Your thoughts and your emotions create your physicality, create your reality. Mm. And when you're living that and you know that, you're, you can, and you're actually conscious of that, you're awake, you're, uh, you take every thought captive. But if you're not conscious of that, if you're unconscious about what it is you really believe and you don't really know what's driving you, you're just being driven by your emotions, your pain, your whatever it is. Is it, it? And we can get on that loop, get on a loop. And I, that cycle broke, you know. And it was it broke through tragedy. It broke through pain, you know. When the When, when the pain of remaining the same is um, greater than the fear of change, then you can change. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. So it's no longer the fear of changing, isn't But we're so often we get identified with, um, with the same routine. We get in, our, in this comfort zone, and I always like to be out on the edge. I always like to be in the the unfamiliar, you know, be in the mystery now more than anything else. I love to be in the mystery, but we do, we get comfortable, mm. we get too comfortable. The one thing that we can always count on is change. Everything's going to change. Yeah. You know, we're going to continue to evolve. We're going to continue to grow. Yeah. Um, mm. there, there's a, uh, in, in physics, there's a term known as entropy which is that uh, everything is born out of chaos. It's the nature mm. of how uh, things in the universe work. Uh, and in that sense, uh, change is always constant. Not well, supposed to be. And, but we as human beings, perhaps, for some reason, we're afraid of change. Or, and so we, we continue to do things until, if, unless we change ourselves, situations and circumstances come up to force us into that change. So eventually we either go willingly or, <laughs> or we resist, but we're, we're always going to go in that direction anyway. 
what we resist persists. So that, that is the, you know, when there is resistance, it keeps circling, keeps coming back until you accept what is. And in, in the place of acceptance, there's, there's no more charge. There's the neutrality of it. And then you can, you can go anywhere from there. Then you can be a conscious creator. Well, what but, is, go ahead. What, what is neutrality though? What is mm. neutrality? Because people do speak about that a lot. Um, but what is that? Kind of like a stick shift, right? You ever drive a stick? A few times. <laughs> All right. So you got to put it in first gear, you go forward. You put it in reverse, you're going, uh, you're going backwards. You put, if you're in neutral, you're not going anywhere. You're not moving. Okay. You're, just, you're, you're at that place of peace, right? That's neutral. From neutral, you can go anywhere. From neutral, you can give it meaning. You can decide where it is you want to go. Now, how, right? Now, how, how do you live your best life from that place of neutral? Because from that place of neutral, we can then give it meaning, but we have to be neutral first. Otherwise, we're being driven by the emotion, mm. by the stimulus. Now, as a conscious creator, we want to give it meaning. I say, oh, what is it I want to experience? You know, in my younger years, I wanted to experience being a developer, being a broker, you know, teaching people how to create wealth using real estate as a vehicle. I did that. I did, and I did it really well. Man, I did it great. I did a great job of that. I had this idea of being a, you know, being this incredible husband and this father. And, you know, I was doing all those things really well and until I wasn't. <laughs> until I wasn't. Um, and then again, there's no judgment. It's neither good nor bad. It just, it just is until we give it meaning. But if you get to a place where you can be completely neutral and then be inspired, right? That download, source, inspired, And I'm not talking about being, um, oh, what's the term? That escaped me. It inspired is, for me, is God breathed, is, is like my, the highest self. And what am I passionate about? What am I, what's really lighting me up? And I move in that direction. Then I begin to give it meaning and move in that direction. Mm. That is like, that's living the, in an inspired life for me. Okay. Yeah. What, uh, f for me, what was coming up as you were, as you were um, explaining that was, um, well, I understand neutrality in a sense is, being present it's like being mm -hmm. an observer you're not attached to anything uh in a sense that it would be just like the creator himself which is which exists through all things including ourselves and it doesn't have any judgments or predispositions to anything it just is what about love mm -hmm. what is that and how does that uh relate to neutrality or this presence or isness? I, I tend to use the word love and acceptance interchangeably. So neutrality, love, acceptance. Is it the same? I, I believe so. But we the word love has so many connotations to so many different people. It gets really, you know, that's where I've taken the word and given it the connotation of acceptance. I've, I've tried to simplify it because you've got all these different kinds of love. And you're, what you're really describing is a, is a passion, you know. I mean, is a... Like I can have a love for ice cream and I can have a love for my wife. I mean, it's a love for my children. I love, and so you give it all of these 
connotations and 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 each experience is just a little bit different has a little different flavor right but it's still love am am i going to accept them am i going to accept humanity as it is in the moment let's let's just you know take any example you want along the way and uh i mean you can use the biblical examples if you want you know you can use the the moment that i'm triggered the moment that i have an experience and somebody has done something somebody has you know created a, what we would call us like a societal wrong an act of violence an act of Whatever the act is, can I accept that? Can I be can I be neutral? It's hard. Can I, hey, I didn't say it was easy. I'm just <laughs> you know, when, and the only way that I got there for me was recognizing that I'm a that I've created a hundred percent of my reality. That you know, all my past, I'm no victim, my friend. I'm no victim. None of that stuff was done to me. I created that. The, the the physical representation, right? The physical reality that we experience is created out of our thoughts and our emotions, and it just manifests in the physicality and what we experience. And and so the by the law of attraction, everything that I am just shows up. It just it just shows up reflecting me reflecting that which I am. And so when I say, be that which it is you want to experience, be that, really, truly be that. So if you want more compassion or love in your life, you want to experience acceptance, then be accepting. You want to experience love, then be loving. You want to experience generosity, be generous. You want to experience kindness, be kind. You want to experience compassion, be compassion. Now, if you want to experience judgment, okay, go out there and judge. It comes right back at you, right? If you want to experience whatever the agreed, you know, you there you go. Um, my puppies, she'll knock on my door until I let her in, so. Good girl. You know, man's best friend, right? A dog. It's unconditional love. No matter what you, you know, what's going on, they just, they love you unconditionally. Uh, Rick, um, we have spoken, there's so many things for us to really speak about. Um, but uh, I wanted to get to these round of questions. Uh, yeah, if you yeah. For it. Yeah. I, I'm totally up for, so... I, I'm totally up for spending time with you, just being present with you, because I, I'm, I'm grateful and thankful for your, your presence and to be in your presence. You're such a beautiful reflection. And I'm just, I'm grateful for who you are, for your being. It is, um, it's quite comforting to be in your presence, and I'm thankful for who you are. Yeah, I'm happy to spend time and answer any questions, you know. I mean, <laughs> my hope is that, that others will benefit from it from this um i think so yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> all right so these these are uh these are questions that have i've contemplated a lot but sort of and some of them have uh some deep meaning to uh first question do aliens exist well why wouldn't they Yeah. Why, why wouldn't they? If you can think it up, it's got to exist, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, that's that's an amazing answer. Yeah, everything that we imagine is real. Just, we don't know how, but it's... Yeah, it's because yeah. we imagine it, it must exist. <laughs> my, my grandpa, when I was a kid, and I ran away from home before I go to that boarding school, 
I, I found myself out at my, my grandparents' ranch and I was going to live in the shaman's cave. And, uh, well, he found me and he took me home and he, and my grandma fed me a bowl of soup and a cup of tea. And he brought out this book. It was like, it was an 1800 encyclopedia. I still got it on my bookshelf and it had pictures of men that looked, had these animal characteristics in it, you know, like, like lion, lionish, goose, goose-ish, you know, uh, you, you men that resembled animals. And he said to me, he said, Sir Richard, be careful what you think for surely you shall become. And uh, that was probably the most sage advice that I'd ever been given. And he, and following that, he said, now men, women, people in the world, they're going to come to you with all of their ideas of how the world works in religion, philosophy, theology. And he says, at the end of the day, you have to decide for you. You have to know yourself. Do not let others influence you in that respect. Know for yourself. Know who you are. And uh, you need to be careful what you think for surely you shall become because. So how does that apply to aliens? Mm. Um, I, I think that they exist. I think that, you know, that anything that we imagine that, you know, multiple realms, realities, you know, the dream state, whatever you want to call it, you know, okay. it's all there. Doesn't it, matter. It doesn't matter though. It, yeah. Just the present oh. matters. What's that? Just the present moment matters and that's it. That's good. Yeah. What about uh, past lives reincarnation? What are your thoughts on that? Um, Have we been here, done this before? You, me, cool. speaking now, or our connection, and every connection that we have. Why wouldn't we have? I, I did a past life regression once, and in it, well, no, that's not true. Because I, I think I've done some. I've done a. I've did a breakthrough session once with a where I did a timeline regression, and I don't know that it, I even went in past lives, but um, I did a time. I did a past life regression once with a a really good friend, somebody I trusted, and I I I can tell you that I have been uh, like the first atom. So I had a I had an experience where I was floating above the earth and and to, to the point where I actually touched the earth with and, and looked at my foot and it was like the first human foot stepping on the on the soil on virgin soil. I have I felt as if I were Zeus and I had felt as if I were Jesus and I'd known that I'd been all of that. And so much more. So, um, you know, who are we really? Who, you know, if, if not the divine, if not the divine in a unique expression in the present moment, I don't even know. I don't know that time is what we think it is. I mean, time's on this linear form, so we've, I mean, there's other theories, you know, like the holographic universe. I I can't tell you that I paid much attention to it or learned much in, in those realms. I'm, I'm learning and growing every day, and, but at the same time, it's like, I'm just enjoying the present moment. What would you tell yourself as a 20 year old, if you could go back in time with what you know now? Have fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Have, have fun. I mean, it's, it's an amazing journey. Have fun. Enjoy the heck out of it. 
Don't forget to laugh. Don't take yourself too seriously. Have fun. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who uh, is on the path of self-discovery just like yourself? Don't take yourself too seriously. Have fun. Okay. <laughs> what are three books that influenced you most and why? Mm. Gosh, I've read so many and I, and I continue to read. I can I just read your book. Your book was amazing. Thank you. I, yes. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time reading the Bible. I'd read it like seven times through and I never really got it. I'd always like, I, I struggled with, I struggled with it. I, I could identify with all of the apostles and I could identify with, you know, Jesus. And, but something for me was like this. It was my core. You know, it's what, it's what I chewed on every day for a very long time, for a long period of my life. And, um, I'd read other religious books and I'd read and, and we all learn differently, right? Some people learn by reading. Some people learn by doing. Some people learn by feel. I mean, kinesthetic, auditory. Uh, one of the books that really changed, and I, and I don't know that it was in the reading of the book, but Becoming Supernatural by Joe Dispenza. Yeah. Um, and many of these things, what, what I found is like when I'm reading them, it's just reflecting back at me what I know, which is really weird to say. It's like, oh yeah, okay, that's resonant. You know, I've found in writing, in my own writing, truth is revealed. And then what I read is like, I'll match up. And this came later. Right. This came later because it's it's almost now it's almost instantaneous manifestation. When I think of something and how it fit, and I think and I'm in alignment, boom, it just shows up. I, I live the most amazing, blessed life. It's like miracles happen every day. They just show up. Um, and as as I write, as I speak my truth. Uh, so I am by Howard Falco. Uh, that's just a book I just recently finished. Um, one of my favorite teachers called Kumu is, uh, teaches neuro-linguistic programming. His name's, uh, Dr. Matt. <laughs> I can't even remember his last name. Uh, but it's, you know, I got a bunch of books here. Dr. Matt James. Oh, gosh. Now, thank you, because this really triggered Ho'oponopono. This was uh, Ho'oponopono. Dr. Matt James wrote a book on Ho'oponopono. He also wrote some on Ahuna. Um, you know, he's also the creator of mental and emotional release. But the book that I'd say changed my life immensely and was part of this trigger was the uh, – was a book by Virginia Satir, Ho'oponopono. It was actually her playbook. And it was given to me by my auntie P. Ilani in Maui when I was living in Maui. And I was doing some research on Dr. Matt James. <laughs> I was doing research on Ho'oponopono and it just happened she had studied with Virginia Satir back in the 70s. And she gave me her playbook and she says, no. And she says, now Eli? <laughs> <laughs> read this and let me know what you think. And it, man, it just opened me up like it. amazing. Yeah. Ho'oponopono was the, it's the Hawaiian art of healing and forgiveness and which I practice. In fact, I was practicing it today and I'd noticed a huge significance, big difference in my life when I learned that art. And that is, you know, thank you. I love you. 
you know, please forgive me. The, the art of forgiveness and healing. If one, and I couldn't, I, I didn't see that in the biblical sense because in, from, from the Bible, it was like the, you needed this, you needed a priest, you needed the, you needed some absolution from somebody else, from something else. Mm. You weren't complete. You weren't, I mean, and, and Christianity teaches us that we're, you know, we're broken. And I say, you're not broken. You're not broken. You're perfect. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. You're kind. You don't need to be fixed. There's nothing wrong with you. You're absolutely beautiful, just as you are. Yeah. You don't need for, you know, forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is for you. It's not for somebody else. Forgiveness. The, the reason we, you're no victim, but that's the, the difference between victim mentality and victor mentality. I, I mean, I'm a victor. I'm, a, I'm victorious. Yes. I live a victorious life. I mean, I am, I'm a liberator. I am a, a revelator. You know, I mean, I reveal truth constantly as it just comes forth from my mouth. As I, as I speak my truth, as I speak the truth, it, it's revelation. And that's what, and you're the same. We're all the same. There's no, no difference between you. you and I. Are. So forgiveness, the art of forgiveness, ho'oponopono, any way you can find it, any way one can find um, how to forgive it, be thankful and I love, and practice that every day practicing that so when something comes up that's you know even just the mere act of saying you know thank you for the experience you know I got a trigger thank you for the experience you know please forgive me thank you I love you and it's gone. The release is gone, you know? And, and so it's that, it's that simple. When you, you get in the habit of, of being yourself and allowing you to be you, to be you free, unabashedly, without any guilt or shame, you know, just be you and let the rest go. Yeah. Uh, there's something very healing uh, with those words. You just feel it energetically. Uh, so it is quite powerful. Who is your biggest inspiration? Hmm. Hmm. This is, sounds pretty myopic when I say myself. Mm. It um, because in this process for me, and that's not to say that there's not a ton of people that inspire me, but when I come out and I speak my truth and I can see it physically, see me in the mirror speaking my truth and being that inspiration, being that. I'm inspired. And I'll tell you something, this sounds kind of silly, but if you if you've got any problem with your you know self-respect or you know how you look or how you you know you think you look, you look up in that mirror and tell yourself, you know, damn you a fine looking specimen of the human race. You know, you say that a few times. <laughs> right. I love that. <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> The this, this self-talk, though, I mean, if, if, okay, you, you, what's the alternative, right? You look in the mirror and go, damn, you ugly. Damn, <laughs> you ugly. Some oh. people do that. <laughs> they, they do, right? Yeah. I mean, they do. It's like, no, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. You're, you're, you're the unique expression of the divine. So walk in that. You know, man, you are divine. You are God-breathed. You have a unique opportunity to create the experience that you want to have in your life so what is it you want to experience you probably most people probably know more of what they don't want to experience as opposed to defining what it is they do want i mean that's why we got all these self-help books out there that's why we got all this you know the business and you know it's all about making money now, i can promise you one thing it's not about money it's not about money all money is is energy and there's is, plenty of it what is it about 
Um, being the authentic you, the unique, authentic expression of you, your unique gift that only you can bring because even though you're God, even though you are the divine incarnate in this, you know, suit, <laughs> if you will, um, you have a unique expression and how else but to, to do that, to express yourself, you know, whether that's music, whether that's art, whether that's, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever your unique gift, whatever lights you up inside your passion that you get just turned on, tapped in, tuned in, turned on, you know, I mean, where you get to where it just lights you up. Go do that. And don't let anybody tell you to do anything different. Just don't pay attention to those voices that are the lies that tell you you're something less than beautiful and wonderful and kind and remarkable and genius and special because you really are anything less is a lie anything less is a lie it's coming from a place of not you not your highest self If today was your last day on earth, what would you, you do? What I'm doing right now, having this conversation. Wouldn't have it any other way. This is, um, if I die 10 minutes from now, I'm good. If I die right now, I'm good. There's nothing more I need to express. I just, I'm, I am elated to be able to have these conversations and be present with you so thank you thank you rick for um joining me on this to do this podcast um yeah just a beautiful being hmm. yeah, we reflect each other in that way uh, very grateful to you and um look forward to more things that we can do together and share our information to the world my honor and pleasure so I will look forward to it. Thank uh, you. If, how can people uh, follow you and learn about what you do yourself? Mm. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, the breath of Eli, right? The breath of Eli. <laughs> it's pretty simple. E-L-Y. Uh, there's a website and there's, a, you know, on Instagram on uh, Facebook, you can find me the breath of Eli, just Rick Eli, the breath, you know, the breath of Eli. Uh, pretty simple. I'm really excited to be tuning into um, th this group held by our friend Brandon Bozart. There's a retreat coming up in Ireland that um, I believe you and I are both going to be there. Uh, so I, I believe that this is going to be an impactful opportunity to, to go and to just Something big is stirring in the heart of man on planet at this moment in time. And I, I believe that we're part of that, that we are this, the catalyst, if you will. And it's, it's, I mean, I hate to use the word cataclysmic, but it is climatic. It is like, it's happening now and we're part of it. And it's just the, just the tip. You know, so we're, we're ushering this in, this beautiful energy that we get to be part of. And, and as people just touch their hand, has put their mind, their body, their spirit into it, it is, it is transformational, absolutely transformational. And um, as we imagine the, the life that we envision, it, that we are that change. We are that change. We, we begin to see the world as a completely new place. We don't, we no longer see the, you know, the pain, the suffering, the, those things. And so, you know, if you want to eradicate those things, you, you be that which it is you want to experience. No, you don't go fight the war. There's nothing to fight. You just be the change. You be you bring that gift to, and 
And if you want to learn how to do that, tap in, tune in, tap in. Come on, let's go. We'll, we'll go. We'll hold hands. Go do it together. Because we're here. We're all one. And I love you. You're wonderful. You're beautiful. And you're kind. So. I love you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Rick. Love that message. Till next time. Aloha.